Hi everybody. In the last several videos, we've been talking about Dr. Bredesen's first book published in 2017 that has served as the first playbook for my dad, The End of Alzheimer's, the first program to prevent and reverse cognitive decline. We've specifically been talking about the Recode Protocol, which he details in the book, Recode for Reversal of Cognitive Decline, which is a personalized protocol that addresses multiple factors contributing to someone's cognitive issues, bringing them back to optimal ranges, and helping patients reverse disease and symptoms. Dr. Bredesen's team has helped hundreds of people reverse their cognitive decline, establish mild cognitive impairment, and it's Alzheimer's disease with this protocol as evidenced in successful studies in 2014, 2018, 2022, and in current clinical trials. Recode is a personalized program that is tailored to how every patient tests on individualized evaluations, and in past videos, we've been focusing our attention on that first testing phase that screens for all the risk factors that contribute to cognitive health and decline. Dr. Bredesen calls this the cognoscopy. We've talked about how all of these tests and lab results paint a clear picture of where a patient stands and how they got there, and how these results are then used to identify which subtype of Alzheimer's or preceding cognitive decline states we're predominantly dealing with. Go to episode 11 for more detail on these subtypes. Once the cognoscopy is complete and a subtype has been established, a personalized protocol can be built out for a patient to follow. The summary of key tests that make up the cognoscopy, which can be found on table two of page 167 of the book, is posted in the Facebook group. So take a look at those. And like we've talked about in episode 12, you'll definitely want to have a seasoned medical professional managing the protocol and having a collaborative relationship with you throughout this process. The key at this stage is to gather as much data as we can to get the clearest picture of where we stand with these markers. And in the last video, we went over the 10 key lab tests to prioritize that are covered by most health insurance plans. And out of these 10, the top two that Dr. Bredesen would want us to keep a steady gauge on. These two are fasting glucose and hemoglobin A1C. Now, we're going to add in a third that may not typically be covered by insurance, but complements these first two. It's typically about another $30 out of pocket when requested, but well worth the investment. This third lab is fasting insulin. So, Fasting glucose or blood sugar has long been a risk factor for diabetes. Bredesen's team has found that the optimal testing range for patients' improvement on the protocol is between 70 and 90. Hemoglobin A1C as a measure of your average blood sugar over the last three months has commonly been the key marker to diagnose prediabetes and diabetes. Bredesen's optimal testing range for A1C is 5.6 or below. Fasting insulin is a very important but often overlooked test that can tell us a lot about our metabolic health. This is because when we start to develop metabolic dysfunction, our fasting insulin will start to rise before our blood sugar and A1C will. So it can sound the alarm a lot sooner and alert us to the fact that we need to start making some changes. Bredesen's team has seen the best results when patients get their fasting insulin to 4.5 or below. These three markers together give us a real clear picture of not only our blood sugar control, but our overall metabolic health. And even if prediabetes or diabetes has not been diagnosed, when these markers are outside these optimal ranges, it typically points to the state that precedes them, which is insulin resistance. For optimal cognitive health and function, we're going to want the opposite of that. We're going to want insulin sensitivity. Dr. Bredesen has seen that reversing insulin resistance and restoring insulin sensitivity made the biggest difference in preventing and especially accelerating the course of reversing cognitive decline. But what is insulin resistance? Without diving too deep in the video, we'll leave that for future videos. We'll break it down like this. When we eat food, especially carbohydrates, sugars, and starches, our body breaks these down into glucose. Our cells uptake that glucose for energy, but not without the important hormone our pancreas produces, insulin. Insulin acts like an escort that brings glucose to the cell and unlocks the door so glucose can enter the cell and be used up to produce energy. When we develop insulin resistance, it's like glucose and insulin show up to the cell's door, but insulin can't quite find the right key to open the door. Long story short, insulin starts having more and more trouble opening the door for glucose to get into the cell. So less glucose gets into cells, which creates an energy problem because cells have less fuel to produce energy with. And it also causes an inflammatory problem because with less glucose entering the cells, more of it pools in the blood, causing inflammation and a whole host of other problems. Our brains are especially sensitive to insulin resistance and this shortfall of fuel as they are on average only about 2% of our total body weight but consume anywhere between 20 to 25% of our total daily energy intake. Our brains work hard every day and they need a lot 
and high quality fuel. There are good reasons and very good studies that demonstrate why Alzheimer's has been more and more referred to as type 3 diabetes. In fact, an American Diabetes Association study from 2004 showed that up to 81% of all Alzheimer's patients also had type 2 diabetes as a comorbidity, whether formally diagnosed or undiagnosed. I've linked that paper in the description below. Dr. Bredesen found that insulin resistance was the single most important metabolic contributor to Alzheimer's disease development and progression, and that the biggest drivers that cause insulin resistance for us were diets high in simple carbohydrates, such as sugar, processed food full of high fructose corn syrup, sedentary lifestyles, poor sleep, and chronic stress from work and home lives. But he also found that the antidote to reversing insulin resistance and restoring sensitivity was optimizing the right diet, exercise, sleep, and stress reduction programs within patients' protocols. We'll dive deeper into these in future videos, especially diet, as it is a big lever. In summary here, for optimal cognitive health and function, Dr. Bredesen wants are fasting glucose between 70 and 90, hemoglobin A1C at 5.6 or below, and fasting insulin at 4.5 or below. We're going to go deeper on insulin, its other roles in the brain, insulin resistance, and sensitivity in future videos. But the bottom line for now is that these are the three most important lab markers for us to consistently keep track of whether our objective is prevention or reversal or just performing at our best. If you found this information helpful, please feel free to share this video with anyone you think it could serve. And remember, I'm not a doctor. I don't have a PhD. I'm a caregiver and citizen researcher on the ground helping a loved one, someone just like you. This information is for educational purposes only. Please consult your medical practitioner before implementing any changes. Thank you for watching. My dad thanks you. Hope these resources are helpful to you and your family. And see you in the next video. Thanks.